Hello, I'm Sky Matsuhashi, founder of SmartPokerStudy.com, the place for poker players who are always striving to be better today than they were yesterday. Poker people, make sure you listen to episode 68, where I discuss the best poker software for improving your game, Flopzilla. It's part of Splitsuit's hand-reading lab, and I never study without it. Hey, poker people, thanks for tuning in and telling your friends, because that's how we grow this show. And thanks for your Patreon support. So today was going to be part four of the hand reading lab, but I just got back from my Vegas trip and a couple of tourneys that I played there, one of which was, of course, the Colossus, like I told you about before. And my whole trip, the tournaments, all my experiences, everything is just really fresh in my mind. So I'd like to discuss heading to the WSOP and what to look out for and, you know, things to expect when you're there. I'll give you some tips for your next live tournament, and I'll end with some valuable lessons that I learned from this past weekend's play. So Head on over to the show notes at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 70 for links to everything I mentioned today and to sign up for the weekly boost. It's no longer a newsletter, but simply an exclusive piece of poker play or study strategy only for those who are tough enough who have the guts to sign up for it. Alrighty, so let's talk about heading to the WSOP. This is actually my fourth year of going, and, you know, regretfully, it's four years of not cashing a single event. But, you know, if you play two events a year, that's only eight events, that's eight tourneys. It's so easy to go online and play eight tourneys in one day and not cash at all, you know? So it's kind of par for the course for me. Uh, but, you know, one of these years will be my year, and I'll cash in a couple, maybe even get a bracelet or something. That would be awesome. But so I have a list of kind of things to look out for, things to do, things to pay attention for when you go to the WSOP uh, in, you know, at the Rio there in Las Vegas. And this list isn't, you know, it's it's not an exhaustive list. It's just some of the things that I really noticed and paid attention for this year. So one of the things, of course, it is super busy before every single tournament. So I really recommend you going online, WSOP.com, and uh, pre-reg for any of the tournaments. And also, while you're there, you could take a look at the tournament schedule, look at those daily deep stacks, what uh, what tournaments are going on during your stay, which ones you want to play at, which ones might be fun to watch, and that kind of thing. So plan everything ahead of time. Pre-register for your games online or for your tournaments online. And one thing that is so, so incredibly important, especially if you go to a freaking tournament like the Colossus, where there's 21,000 players playing over six flights, you know? I mean, that is a ton of players, so you got to be smart about it and get your tickets early. So if you pre-reg, uh, you know, just go online, pay for your tickets. You could pay with a credit card and all that stuff online. Get to the place. Now, if your event is on a Saturday, like mine was, you know, I played day 1E, I think was the... Uh, was the flight 1E. I picked up my tickets the night before on Friday. And that way I'm not there in the super long line because I remember down that long hallway, it was all the way back, like, uh, maybe 200 feet or so, just uh, full of people right before the event waiting to get their tournament ticket. Well, don't be like them. Either go early in the morning before your event starts or, you know, the night before when there is not a big line of people because once you get your ticket, you're all set to go. You just go to the table, your seat number, pull out your ID, hand it to the dealer, and you're good to go to play. You know, no waiting in line right before the thing. No being stressed out. I mean, it's crazy when you see guys going to get their tickets. They're all stressed out because the tournament just started. They don't want to miss a hand. They want to get there for the early blinds when all the weaker players still have their big stack that they can take. And so, you know, they're all antsy in line. As soon as they get their ticket, they run to the table, skip all of that, get your tickets the day before, arrive nice and casually early, scope out the scene, look for some hot chicks, hot dudes if you're into that, whatever, and get to the table and the chair nice and timely, no rush, sit down and start playing. Uh, the second thing that I'd want to really recommend is stay there on the cheap. Now, if you are making this a super big, fun vacation kind of trip, you're taking your wife, you've got your, uh, you know, your 22 year old son with his 
22 year old wife and that kind of thing you're making a trip out of it you know that's fine stay at a really nice place and whatever but if you're going by yourself or if you're just going with a buddy stay cheap you know screw the 150 200 a night places you know i stay off the strip i find a nice little 50 bucks per night because i drive there myself you know and i have a car to go to and from the rio it only takes five minutes from the place i stayed just up flamingo boulevard there or road whatever it's called flamingo um I think it was Flamingo. So just up the road, I stayed at this place called, and it was a crappy, dinky little place, but it was nice and stay, safe. It was called the Fortune Hotel and Re- Resort, or yeah, Hotel and Resort. And no way, in no shape or fashion was it a resort for fifty bucks a night. No way. But you know, I stayed there, super cheap, um, and get to and from the Rio in five minutes. And even if you don't have a car, there is Uber available. Now this year. Uber partnered with the WSOP and they actually had, uh, you know, outside the, the main doors there for the WSOP tournament where it all takes place. They had a Rio, not, uh, not a Rio. I'm sorry. They had an Uber station outside the Rio there and it was perfect. You know, I didn't use it because I had a car, but I heard a lot of people saying that that was great. They stayed away from the Rio in a cheaper place or whatever. They just used Uber to get back and forth really quick and easy. So, you know, you could do that. And from what I understand, they're cheaper than taxis. And taxis don't try to gouge you. You know, those Uber drivers, they rely on their ratings, uh, you know, to stay an Uber driver. So they'll get you to and from your de- destination the smart way. And uh, there's no issues with these taxi drivers that take you the long way because you're an out-of-town tourist and you don't know Vegas. You know, that kind of thing. So another tip for the WSOP is you got to get there early and get used to the atmosphere. So what I recommend is going in the very first day before your tournament starts the next day and walk around, check out every single room, understand the layout, check out the cash games, the sit and go area, the deep stack area, which is where they play other tournaments as well, uh, you know, and go to the Brasilia room and go to all the different rooms and check the stuff out. Go to the big mothership live stage where they play the final table of all the big tournaments and tell televised stuff who knows when you get there there might actually be a televised tournament going on you never know and uh just get used to the layout find the bathrooms go visit the poker kitchen look at the exorbitant prices and the kind of smallish uh portions that they have on all their food get used to that ahead of time before you actually go and play on your game day you know and check out the wsop shop it's right there in the lobby and what i do every year and this is funny every year i say to myself if i cash in something i'm going to treat myself with something cool This year, as I was looking around, they have lots of nice sweaters and hats and all that jazz, but they had a pretty cool WSOP flask, you know, put my rum in there and and take it with me when I go to, you know, whatever, you know, I've never had a flask, but I saw the flask. It looked pretty cool. That was my goal. That was what I was going to buy. I didn't cash, so I didn't buy it. I'll have to save it for next year, you know. And one thing that I recommend, too, is I said check out the different rooms, the sit-and-go area, the cash area. But go ahead and sit down and play something. Uh, if you want to try to spend 125 175 250 bucks to try to win entry into a bigger event, play some sit-and-goes or something. Or just sit down at a cash table. They have one, two, no, I'm sorry, it was one, three, two, five, and beyond uh, for cash. So go ahead and sit down and play some cash. Just get used to it. Talk to some people. Uh, just, you know, get comfortable comfortable with the room and all that and all that kind of thing and another thing i recommend is look for some famous faces so as you're walking around just keep your eyes up don't keep your eyes on the ground watching where you're going and that kind of thing but keep your eyes up because you can see famous people everywhere i went on one of the busiest weekends and so and you know for the colossus it's all weekend warrior people like me who do not have huge bankrolls so there wasn't a lot of famous faces but when i've gone in the past i saw just about every big name poker player uh you know that's that's playing in the game this year the most famous person i saw was probably james woods and you see him every year at the wsop if you're paying attention but i also saw a lot of other poker players that you might know like dennis phillips george danzer bernard lee alan kessler uh greg raymer vanessa russo uh i saw robert mizraki ted forrest bill chin i saw benjamin and alessandro they were there um and i heard chris ferguson actually showed up played in the 7k not 7k 10k seven card stud event uh but he was busted out before i got to the tables to watch the the final two tables play it out and stuff but yeah so look for some famous faces because i guarantee you're going to see them a lot of the guys like daniel nogranu and 
uh, Phil Hellmuth and Phil Ivey, you can see them at tables playing. You won't often see them walking through the crowds because they go behind the scenes. They go through the employee area and that kind of stuff. But if you check out the tables, especially if you're there during some big events, uh, you can see some famous faces, which is pretty cool. I've never stopped anybody asking for a picture or an autograph or any of that kind of stuff. But, hey, feel free to do it if, if that suits you. And, oh, I kind of just mentioned it, but the next tip is to watch some big events. So when I was there, the 10K stud event started, and I was playing in a tournament when it started, so I couldn't go there and see all of the, what is it, like, it might have been five tables of, you know, people willing to pay 10K, uh, which is way out of my price league, of course, or price range, of course. But uh, if you go and see an event like that, you'll see all the famous faces. You'll see the Gus Hansons and the George Danzers and the, you know, all that, Greg Ramers and all, well, he doesn't play in the 10Ks, but you'll see all the big names at those at those tables, which is pretty cool, you know, just to say, hey, I saw him in real life even if you didn't actually even if I actually don't take the time to meet the guy all right so the next thing I want to talk about is some live tournament tips and these are things that I actually take into every live tournament that I play and these are kinds of things that mm, come automatically for me when it comes to online play but when you're at a live table and I'm sure all of you live players that are listening to this you're saying sky this is old hat I know all this crap already but I'm going to go through it because this is the kind of stuff that I must pay attention for when I go play live events because online all this stuff kind of comes to me because I'm so used to it I'm not as used to live play as I'd like to be um, so these are some of the live tournament tips that I'm giving you but these are the things that I keep for myself I actually have a uh, a note within Evernote on my phone with all of these things listed out with a few others as well uh, for me to pay attention to as I play. So the number one tip, not the number one, the first tip is know the structure. So for the WSOP, different events have different structures. Some have levels taken out. Some have antis hitting later or earlier. Whatever the case is, know the structure. Uh, and you could do this by either going online or before each event, they have structure sheets out where, you know, where you pay for your entry into the event. You can grab that structure sheet and get started studying it, you know. You want to see what your starting stack size is. Look at the structure sheet and understand how many BBs you have if you just have that starting stack at the different levels. Eventually, at maybe level 4, 5, or 6, if you still have just a starting stack, you might have a 10 to 15 to 20 BB stack if you're still at that starting stack. So you need to know when you'll likely be a short stack, assuming that you haven't chipped up along the way. If you're at 20 or 40K when you started with 5K, great. You know, the study that you did, now you need to pay attention to which level in the future you're going to be kind of short stacked uh, because, you know, you're not at that starting stack anymore. So know the structure is that first tip. The second tip is play your normal game. So we all know how to play. We have our set ways of playing. Sometimes when you go to a table and then, you know, you're used to making three big blind raises and everybody around you is making three big blinds at your own local casino or online, whatever the case is. But you get to this new table, the WSOP, everybody's making min raises or maybe they're making four big blind open raises or something like that. Don't just jump in and do what everyone else is doing unless you see that there's a valid reason for that. So I, what I want you to do is make adjustments, but don't do things just because these other guys are doing them. If you notice somebody, you know, maybe your normal opening is three big blinds, but every time you opened, you've been getting five callers. Well, screw that. Make it four or 4.5 big blinds. You know, make the adjustments necessary to get the to get the results that you want. Don't just make adjustments based on what the other players are doing. Just because they're doing it doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. They might have no reason at all for making their open raise three and a half big blinds. It's just what they feel like doing, you know? And uh, the third tip is sit up straight, take a deep breath, and look left before every hand that you play. And I got these tips from Tommy Angelo and his book, Elements of Poker. And, you know, if you haven't read it yet, you've got to check out Elements of Poker, one of the best books. So when you're dealt a hand, before you look at it, sit up straight, Take a deep breath, take your hands off of your chips, and look to your left. And, of course, sit up straight and deep breath. That just kind of physically prepares you for the hand that you're about to play. You know, it gets you helps to get you in the right mental space. But one of the reasons you want to look left is because whatever action happens ahead of you, so looking right to the players that act before you, that doesn't really matter. You know, whether somebody raises or makes a three bet or there's three limpers ahead of you, that doesn't matter. You can, you can concern yourself with that in a little bit. But you want to look left at first because some players choreograph their plays. So let's say you know that there's a nitty guy playing. He looks down at his cards and you notice that he he looks for a long time, 
puts his cards down, and then he starts reaching for his chips and maybe starts even counting out his stack. Or maybe you're in the hijack, and the cutoff and the button, before action gets to you, the cutoff and the button look at their hands, and then they, they make motions like, they're uninterested and they're going to fold. And you look down at Jack Seven Suited. Great. Go ahead and open. You think these two guys to your left are going to fold, giving you ultimate position in the hand. Uh, you know what I mean? So do stuff like that. Look left first to get an indication of what these players might be doing. Now, a lot of players nowadays are very smart and they don't make any or they don't look at their cards until action gets to them. And then great. You know, if if a player is doing that, you know that he's probably not totally not absolutely but probably a little bit more skilled than some of the others at the table they'll look at their cards right away so the next tip tip number four is watch the action and this is really important to do it can get a little boring while you're sitting there playing but you've got to watch the action know who's a limper who's a razor who's a three better who makes all who always makes c bets who constantly bets when the other players show some kind of a weakness you know so watch that action and along with that, along with watching the action, tip number five is taking notes on your opponents, especially the two to the left and the two to the right. So when you sit at any table, you know that the people that you most frequently play are either or play with are either the donks at the table that call and raise every single hand. They're seeing 86% of hands, so they're always in a pot. Yeah, sure, there's them. But at your standard table where people are folding crap, uh, you are concerned with the two people to your left, of course, because when they're in the blinds, you're on the button. And that's, you know, really important because you'll be opening or raising a lot of buttons. So you need to know, you need to understand those kinds of players to your left. And the two to your right, well, that's when you're in the big blind and the small blind. So it's really important to know how those two act over there as well. And then, um, you know, what I always do is I have a quote unquote table conditions note within Evernote. And I just call it table conditions. And that's where I have listed down seat one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 whatever seat I am, I'll put hero and then I'll make notes for all the different seat numbers at the table on the types of players, you know, loose, passive guy, open limps a lot, uh, makes a lot of C bets, likes to three bet. The guy loves calling and seeing flops, whatever it is, I'll make notes, you know, and another thing with taking notes, I do those for player notes within Evernote, but I also have a notebook with me uh, to take notes on hands that I played or sometimes hands that I observe, but normally hands that I play. And I could use Evernote for it, but man, I am so slow with Evernote. And just like with texting, with email, with Evernote on your phone, that autocorrect stuff, you know, when you push the word or the letter F for flop, you just do F and then space, it'll, it'll type out from or for or just automatically and so that kind of stuff really screws me up i write out a lot of my notes by hand within my notebook um so step number two four six step number six is trust your gut and this is something that that i take with me no matter what trust my gut sometimes your mind subconsciously picks up on cues that you had no idea are there you know you know that you should be folding this particular hand even though it seems like a good spot because of the way the player who opened opened the hand but you know you didn't notice it but there's some kind of i don't know subconscious thing that caught it and then you know to fold you know so just really trust your gut when you play live poker and online uh and then uh another tip that i have the, the final tip actually is play in position this is one of the most important key things and it's so important in live play position rules the roost and then so if you have position on every single hand or most hands that you play you're going to be more likely to get really deep to take your opponent's chips to bet out when they show weakness and take the pot down all that kind of stuff so do your best to play in position when you're in those early positions ditch those ace nine offsuit and you know or ace nine suited in the ace jack offsuit there's so many players especially when 10 handed that can play behind you you open the 2.5 or 3 bbs there's so many guys that can be calling you and can make your life hell playing against four other guys who all have position on you when you have an ace nine or an ace jack suit and you don't flop anything good you know so just play in position and when you're out of position try to stick to stronger hands of course 
Alrighty, so before we get to the lessons I learned from this trip, let me tell you about one way that you can support me uh, and this show, of course, and that's Patreon. It's a website where you can support an artist for all the content that they create, and of course, you can find me there. So by supporting me on Patreon, you'll keep me up and running, and you can get some exclusive poker strategy content that I won't deliver anywhere else. So visit patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy for more details on supporting me through Patreon, and I'll give you a shout out on the uh, on an upcoming show. Okay, so some lessons that I learned from this past trip. Well, the first lesson I learned was know what time the bubble will likely burst. So in the Colossus, I made it six hours in and uh, the bubble was bursting for all the other Colossus flights between six hours and seven hours. So I was really close to the bubble. And I think if I would have realized it at the time, I realized it after the fact when, when I walked away from my final hand and I, I looked at my phone and I saw what time it was and I calculated, wait a second, 10 o'clock, four o'clock, it's been six hours. I was really close to the bubble, you know? So online, of course, it's really easy because they tell you right there in the statistics how many players are left, what, how many uh, positions get played, how many positions, how many uh, how many spots get paid. So you know, oh, we have five people to go, six people to go. Well, eventually, at any WSOP or any live event, they'll tell you when it's hand for hand, the dealers will stand up and you'll know. But if you're not paying attention, you don't know that it's coming soon. And I'll have to be honest, I wasn't paying attention like I should have. If I had, I probably would have laid down my hand or played it differently because I thought that we had a long time to go and I was just looking to collect chips instead of maybe lasting a little bit longer and throwing away or playing kind of marginal spots a little bit better. So the second tip I have, or the second lesson that I learned is let the tension out. Uh, when you're playing at the table and you've been there for a long time, not maybe not you, me, I start to get tension up around my neck and shoulders in my head. I start getting maybe a headache because I'm thinking too hard. I'm trying to pay attention to all the information. Well, I need to get my ass up out of my seat and walk around a little bit more, uh, go into the corner, do some push-ups, go to the bathroom when I'm in early position and I don't want to play most of my hands there. You know, I need to let the tension out by getting up and getting away from the table. The same thing that I do, you know, when I play online MTTs, every hour there's a five-minute break built into the structure. Well, at the WSOP and for just about all live tournaments, all of you out there listening know that there is no, I'm sorry, there is a break built in, but it's normally every two hours or so for 20 minutes. Well, I don't know how you work, but for me, I need breaks a little bit more frequent than that. So I need to get up, walk around, do some push ups, and skip a hand or two and think about something else for a little while, you know, let the tension out. So the third lesson I learned is don't play timidly. What happens for online play? I play a lot of tables, so I don't treat them all that preciously. You know, one table, I'm playing four or six tables at a time. It's not all that precious. If I bust out of one, I've got other ones going. But when I'm playing live, I do play timidly because it's only one table. So I treat it delicately. I don't want to bust out. I don't want to waste my chips for no good reason. So I play just really timidly. And that's something that I need to stop doing. So that's a lesson that I learned, especially when I was playing in that deep stack tournament after the Colossus. Um, I was just playing way too delicately. And there was so many more spots where I could have three bet to steal, or I could have laid a C bet or a check raise uh, on the flop and that kind of thing. And I was just too timid, you know. And the fourth lesson that I learned is I need to play more live events. I tell myself this, you know, every single month I make it a goal to play two or three live events. But at the end of the month, I didn't, at the end of the month, I didn't play a single one and I always kick myself for it. But, you know, it's something that I just need to do more often. I've got plenty of live tournaments here in town that I can go to. I just need to get my ass up out of the house and go play them, you know. And the fifth and final lesson that I learned was show aggression when others show weakness. Now, I kind of talked about this earlier. But, you know, the more that you play in position, the better that you can do this. You know, when your opponents check to you, whether you were the preflop raiser or it's the turn and they called your C bet. Well, you have the position. Them checking again is a sign of weakness. Just think about their range. Think about how well it hits the flop, what they could have called your flop bet with, and then barrel the turn after they check, you know, uh, or even just showing more aggression. If you're out of position, you can check, then donk lead on the next street. And as I was watching, I was playing timidly, so I wasn't doing this as much as I should. But it's crazy. As I was watching, I was paying attention to players actually showing aggression when others showed weakness. And I saw how often 
often it was working for them. But I just couldn't pull the trigger for myself when I had some of these opportunities to do it, you know. I held my own and I lasted, you know, a bit into the two tournaments that I played, two live tournaments that I played. But, you know, I just, I know I could have been more aggressive. And, you know, what's really funny, uh, the night after I busted the $235 deep stack 2 p.m. event, which was two nights ago, I think Sunday night. Yeah, Sunday night. Um, when I busted that one, I went back to the hotel room. Uh, ate dinner and then I played some online. And then when I got back online, I felt natural and comfortable and I was making those aggressive plays and I was doing stuff in position that I should have. It's just crazy how for me, my live play doesn't match my online play and I need to get to the point where it matches. So, um, you know, so going back to that fourth lesson I learned, play more live tournaments. I need to do that because if I do that, I'll get more used to it. And then along with uh, lesson learned number five, I can show more aggression when others show weakness. Well, thank you so much for listening today. I love feedback, so hit me with it through the show notes, or you can also send an email to sky at smartpokerstudy.com, tweet me at smartpokerstudy, or post in the Facebook group at smartpokerstudy.com slash discuss. And send me those questions. We got another Q&A this Friday, and, you know, every Friday we got more coming up. So please send me those questions so I can help you out specifically to your needs. All righty, poker people. Be sure to come back this Friday for, like I said, another Q&A where I answer some more of your super killer questions. And next week in episode 70, I promise I'll continue the Hand Reading Lab series and I'll discuss thinking about your own ranges and creating them based on different scenarios like your responses to three bets or what range you'd continue with versus a flop C bet. Of course, word of mouth is the best advertising, and I thank you for sharing this show with other poker peeps. It only grows with your help, so I'm asking you to share it with someone who will get value from it just as you do. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet. I want to lie, help. I want the world to-